And we're back for the second day uh, at the Singularity Summit in Amsterdam in the Lamar Theater, um, bringing you a lot of uh, interviews with uh, distinguished guests uh, that have been talking on stage here and other people that are uh, in the audience. Um, uh, it's going to be a great day. We're going to do a lot of interviews today. So you can watch this live or you can watch it uh, uh, on demand on our YouTube channel or the YouTube channel of Singularity University Netherlands uh, uh, just after this uh, finishes. So today with me is our first guest, uh, uh, Ramesna. Hi there, pleasure to be here. Yeah. How are you? I'm good, thanks. You just you? gave a talk and everybody was very happy uh, to hear your message. So what did you talk about? I talked about the future of energy. I talked about energy as an exponential technology. We have this huge crisis of climate change. We have 1.3 billion people without electricity, but we also have this incredible plunge in the price of solar power, of wind power, of batteries, of electric vehicles. So it gives us some hope. How? how how did we get there? How does, uh, how does the, the exponential growth in that and the, the exponential lowering the cost, how did it It's work? really been innovation. I mean, really, policy started it. German policy started solar, really. But it's only been successful because of this incredible price plunge. So a watt of solar power used to cost almost $100 US, and now it costs 36 cents US. So more than a 200 times price reduction in the last two generations. Right. And in, in layman's terms, what, what is it? What, what, uh, and it? Well, in layman terms, how about this? In sunny parts of the world, contracts for solar power are being signed at less than half the price of gas or coal or any other technology. The cheapest deals ever signed for electricity on the planet now are all solar, all in sunny parts of the world. Even now with a very low oil price? Even now with a very low oil price. It doesn't matter. So the large oil corporations are, uh, should worry? I think they should worry. And really, they don't compete with solar and wind directly, but they do compete with electric vehicles. And electric vehicles are tiny today. There are only 1 million electric vehicles out of 1 billion cars, 0.1%. But they're doubling every 18 months or so. And so within 5 to 10 to 15 years, they will be taking enough oil demand off the market that the oil price might be permanently low. Now, there's a lot of demand uh, uh, for energy from consumers, but uh, there's a big problem, I, I think, in, in, uh, in industrial demand. Large factories, uh, um, how, how is the transition uh, working there? Are there a lot of power plants, uh, uh, manufacturing uh, plants that are switching to, to solar or to... I, mean, I think the important thing is, whether you're a home or a retail location or a manufacturing plant, that when you turn on the lights, it works. When you set up your, your equipment, it works. And so most of them don't know, most of us don't know where our power comes from. So as we build a grid that integrates wind and solar and sometimes nuclear and hydro and energy storage, it just as long as it works, as long as we route all that energy intelligently and you get the power you need, we're all happy. And that's what we're headed towards. Sure, but still, I mean, if, if I have like a large chemical plant, usually yeah. these are not powered by, by green energy. They're usually powered by different kind of energies. Well, it, it varies. If they're hooked up to the grid, we see that they're powered by what the grid is. But we do see, for instance, in data centers, you see Google or Apple or Facebook or Microsoft, they are signing deals for wind and solar and hydro specifically for data centers that use as much power as a large factory or a large chemical plant uh, because it's a commitment to them. They know that their customers want them to be green and now it's often the cheapest way that they can buy power too. Now, Singularity University also talks a lot about uh, or tries to deliver these, these, these global grand challenges. Uh, yes. Obviously, power is, is part of the solution uh, to these, these grand challenges. Um, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so energy access itself is a challenge. 1.3 billion people without electricity. And if you don't have electricity, you don't have light at night without burning kerosene that has fumes. Your kids can't study for school and so on. Other challenges, climate change, of course. Abundant clean energy would reduce or potentially stop the pace of climate change. Water, with enough energy you can take dirty water or salt water and make it fresh. Food, farmers in rich countries grow four times as much food per hectare as farmers in poor countries, and a lot of it's about energy access. So energy is a fundamental enabler of human well-being, of economic growth and prosperity. And so we need more clean energy to allow us to prosper in that way without damaging the planet. Right. We also, uh, um, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of Ds in, uh, involved in, uh, in everything with, uh, with Singularity, uh, thanks to Peter Diamandis. Yes. Uh, uh, one D is uh, democratization. Yes. So how is, because is, uh, I see a lot of very large uh, uh, um, 
windmills, I see a yeah. lot of large uh, uh, hydro installations. So how does this work for the rest of the world? Yeah, so democratization is a great one. So those people that don't have access to electricity now, they live primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And for them, it's not about access to a large grid, not if you're in the village. But it is the case that the plunging price of solar means that suddenly people can get electricity who never could before. Just as they're able to get cell phones and totally skipped landlines, a lot of villages and rural areas that have these billion plus people are going to skip the traditional power grid and go straight to solar. Then they'll grow out. They'll build a grid from that out. So we are democratizing access to energy. Is this already happening? Is there examples in the world where you see this happening actually? It, it's happening now. Yes, it's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's happening in India. It's really, by the way, stalled not by the energy technology anymore, because that has a payback time of months if you replace kerosene with solar. It's halted by the lack of finance and banking. But as we deploy mobile technology, as people get smartphones, then phone minutes become a currency. Then they can get uh, mobile banking and get into the modern financial system for the first time. And then they're able to pay for a solar system that suddenly improves their lives tremendously. And distribution? Is it, is it easy to get all these uh, relatively cheap devices to these people? We see it more and more, and it is one of the big challenges working in Africa or parts of India's distribution, but there is a good incentive to do it. I used to visit once to get the energy access there, and then when you do that, then the commerce goes up, and then there's more reason to invest in the roads, and it's a positive feedback cycle. We should just fly over a plane and just uh, drop them from the plane. And, you don't uh, want them to break. <laughs> <laughs> and no, actually, it's important that people have a sense of ownership that actually giving things away to free, for free to people often does not work as well as them paying for it. Because paying even a small amount uh, ensures that there's revenue for the company that maintains those things and fixes them, that there's revenue to invest in R&D for the next generation of these things. And people will take care of the things they paid for better also. All right. um, is there also a cultural aspect? Are there people are there in the world that are well, they're used to a certain way of life, they're used to using this kerosene in another way, or they, they don't really bother to read at night because they're tired and working all day, so they, they don't need it, so they say, ah, well. There's a surprising cultural aspect, which is people, of course, people like light at night, uh, but you see interesting things. People who get a solar system and lights often put their biggest light not inside the home, but with the barn, they have one cow. That's their most prized possession. But we also see the aspirational thing, the cheapest solar systems you can buy are a few watts, and then maybe four light bulbs, basically. And even that is a big step. But the thing that people aspire to often is a television. Because they did have a way to make light before by burning kerosene, but they did not have a connection to the world. Of course, they'll, they'll want a, a charger for their cell phone, too. But if they can get up to a 50-watt system, then they can afford to have a television connected to that, and suddenly they have information access. And that television is going to become a Wi-Fi-enabled hotspot that's going to give them 4G or 5G access to all the world's information on their phone. So that aspirational object is also an object of education, an object of commerce, and that's going to transform the world. Well, that's a very positive view. On the, on the TV, I, I, I slightly disagree with you there because I've seen so many uh, uh, examples where you just go to, to uh, well, an area that is developing and, and basically the first thing that people do is buy a television and not for educational reasons, just to sit back and, and watch sports or, uh, or a soap series. They don't buy it for educational reasons, but it still has a tremendous impact of connecting them. And when I said it's going to become this, this Wi-Fi enabled hotspot, I mean that, not just the metaphorically, I mean that by spreading solar and by the rise of smart devices, People are just going to be more connected than ever before, and that's fundamentally empowering for people. All right. One other topic that we uh, talked about yesterday with a few guests is that we are living in a time, here's people are very optimistic, and uh, you as well. I mean, it's basically, uh, technology is here, it's going to get even, it's going to grow faster, and it's going to solve all the problems. Uh, so sit back and relax, and we'll fix it for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's no, the no. worst possible message. <laughs> no. No, but uh, there's an optimistic view. And, uh, but when you leave this building, you go outside and in, in, the, and in the normal world, um, you see a lot of skepticism, fear. You see uh, yeah. political parties, political systems that are very much conservative, backwards even. Uh, um, so, so, so why do we see these two different kind of views on the world? And, yeah. and how, how, how do you deal with that? Well, let's be clear first. Like, problems are real, and technology is not a magic pixie dust that solves problems, right? We have to invest in it. We have to train people to be entrepreneurs, to take risks, 
through the development. And even then, there's always side effects. There's always some problem. And especially with climate change, we're in a race. The situation is very dire. And even as fast as technology is going, it's not at all clear that we'll stay below 2 degrees Celsius. We probably won't, to be honest. Um, but we will probably also not see 3 degrees Celsius. Now, as for the rest, why are people frightened and so on? I think there's a real phenomenon that technology changing so fast changes society so fast and people feel left behind. They feel threatened. Their old way of life, their old way of working, their job is under threat. And so I think it's incumbent on us to structure the world such that those people are carried along, that they have an invitation to the table, they have a way to participate in this future because that's what makes it less frightening overall. Right. So how, how do you do that? How do you make like Singularity University is, is constructed, well, like a, more like a pyramid, it's more top-down, it's, it's more pretty exclusive and not very in inclusive in the sense that if you live in the Western world and you pay a lot of money, you can go to a conference like yeah. this, but uh, if you live in a rural area it, it, and you don't speak English, it's quite hard to, to, to grasp the ideas of Singularity University. So how, how do you include all these people? Well, we're undergoing a transformation in Singularity University ourselves, where we're trying to scale out to be a more exponential organization and hit more people, be able to impact people more directly. But overall, it, Singularity University is one part of the ecosystem. And it's an ecosystem of tremendous knowledge. You can go online and take a course in programming now for free. You can take an MIT or Stanford uh, real course taught to people that pay tens of thousands of dollars to go to school for a year. You can take that course for free. So the gap is actually increasing. It's not access. The access is even there. It's knowledge. It's uh, sort of awareness that these tools are there. And it's inertia. It's a sense of here's how I've always lived. How do I, why would I want to go do this. So we have to work on that. It's about social systems in a lot of ways. Yeah. I'm also asking this because you are a writer as well. I mean, yes. you're both a non-fiction, as a fiction writer, so yes. you would be the ideal person to, to, to share the story uh, about well, the, the good, and then you could reach a lot of people with that. Uh, yeah. I even read somewhere in your bio that, that uh, one of your books might even be turned into a film. So it, that will it be... It might be, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we, narrative does matter. We talk a lot about facts and figures, but what motivates people is stories and people and leaders and characters. That's what actually drives things. So I think that's vitally important. The entertainment industry has a big role of showing positive futures and not just negative ones, and showing how they can engage in the future and not just be threatened by it. Right. So how do you do that? Because these days, I mean, if you go to the cinema, there's more dystopian than... Uh, it's, it's one thing at a time. And these things come in waves, but it's up to individual creators to make that choice. Fundamentally. Sure. We can't but, make that choice for but them. But you talk to them. And you invite we them do in. talk to them. And Singularity University has some relationship with people in, in Hollywood. You know, it's the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. Right. Just passed, I think, two days ago. Yeah. And that's a show, because when you're making fiction, you have this challenge, there has to be danger, there has to be tension, there has to be something at risk. But that's a show that managed to have that all the time, and yet was telling this very progressive view of a better future. And so I, I hope that we'll see more shows like that being created. Well, and, and more Star Trek, obviously. And more Star Trek. <laughs> Wait, were you a fan? I was a fan, I still yeah. am a fan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So what was, your, what was your favorite technology they had? All right, well, I mean, the transporter beam, of course, has a huge uh, impact, and the replicator has a huge impact. I always looked at the replicator, and it <laughs> yes. wouldn't be grand just to say to the device, I, I'm, I'm, I want to have something to eat like this, and yes. it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, there, there's some people, I, I always, some people are discussing uh, the, um, the matter in which Star Trek is going to get real, like 10%, 20%, or 80% of things already realized or will be realized in the future. So, yeah. how far are we? In your point of view, at a certain less than one percent. So than 1%. here's the thing: with with technology, Star Trek is complete fantasy when it comes to uh, faster than light travel. The transporter beam is maybe technically something that is one billionth of that is possible, but it's not going to be uh, anything like that. And the replicator is also it's very very distant. What Star Trek was really about wasn't the technology. The technology was a back backdrop we're talking about a change in society. And a lot of the best episodes were really about talking about how do cultures interact. Talking, had a, a black person in the cast, a female officer in the cast, relations between alien races. It was all a metaphor for changes happening in the world in the 60s and 70s and up until today. 
Is, is that um, something that you actively pursued uh, within Singularity University as well, having a, a diverse group of people? Absolutely, in, uh, yes. And we talk about societal impacts and thinking about how society changes as a result of this technology, because that's often the thing that we miss the most. If you look at mobile phones or Twitter or phone cameras, uh, we didn't see in the US the Black Lives Matter movement. Nobody predicted that. Or the Occupy movement or the Arab Spring, right? And these things have not all worked out. The Arab Spring did not go the way we wanted. But fundamentally, that was a social change facilitated by this high bandwidth communication in everyone's hand, right? And so those societal impacts are often much bigger than the direct technological impacts. So, and, and things are changing rapidly. Uh, uh, technology is changing rapidly. So you could say that we're uh, all the, the the graphs you see are, are exponential uh, graphs, and usually we're in the knee of the curve. So the, it's the, always the knee of the curve. It's always the knee of the curve. Yes. So, so basically, we are in a massive transformation, but most people outside don't don't know that or don't realize it. Maybe have a hunch, feeling, but do not really see that. Um, and yet, you are. Pursuing this, pursuing this actively, and and, uh, and 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 trying actually to to be part of this acceleration. Does that give you a responsibility as well to to help these people through this uh, transformation, and also like politics and everything, uh, and other people that are a bit behind? I think we do. I think all of us that have affluence or have personal abundance have a responsibility to think through the implications of these technologies for those that have the least or those who are most vulnerable. I think it's absolutely a responsibility. And I think the good news is on a global scale, what we see is that there's a lot happening to reduce poverty, to bring billions of people into the modern world, to reduce disease and so on. I think the people who are most vulnerable now are people in rich nations, but who are lower in income, lower in education, and so on in rich nations, and we have a responsibility to them as well to help create paths forward for them. Right. So, you solved uh, the energy problem. <laughs> so, so basically, you are uh, you, you've done uh, you've done your job uh, at Singularity University. Are you going to switch to a different uh, topic now, or uh, are you the, going to stay with energy now? The energy transition is going to take decades. It's a race. It's a race between how fast we're damaging the planet and how fast we can roll out and accelerate these new exponential technologies, and it's a very close race. And so that's going to be a focus for quite a long time to come. So you're going to stay with the Singularity University in the energy track for quite yes. some time? Now. Yes, I will. All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. So this was the first episode of uh, a long day of talks at Singularity University Summit here in Amsterdam in the, the Lamar. So stay with us or uh, watch our videos on demand in our YouTube channel or the of, uh, YouTube channel of Singularity University in the Netherlands. Thank you.